there's a wonderful story about a man with two umbrellas. A man noticed another man sat day after day reading his Bible on the same bench. One day he decided he was going to go up to him and he said, forgive me for my curiosity, but I'm a minister and I see that you here, are here every day on the same bench reading your Bible. And I assume that meant you were a Christian and just interested in how it happened. And the man replied, yes, as he set his Bible aside. I'm, I'm very glad to talk about it. You see, I'm a Filipino. I was born in a good home in the Philippines. And some years ago, I came to the United States to one of your fine universities to study law. My first night on campus, a student came to me and he said, I've come over to, to welcome you to campus and to say that if there's anything you need, anything at all, that I could do to make you here, make your stay here more pleasant, I hope you'll remember me and call upon me. Then he asked me where I went to church, and I named a church that was, was prevalent in the, in the Philippines, but I did tell him that I wasn't greatly committed to it. He said, well, I can tell you where that church is here in town. It's not easy to find. It's, it's quite, dist quite a distance, but I can make you a map. And so he made me an outline on the way to get to my church, and he left. When I woke up on Sunday morning, it was raining crazy. I mean, cats and dogs, as they say. And I thought to myself, well, I just won't go to church this morning. Surely I can be forgiven this one thing. It's my first Sunday on a new campus. It's raining so hard, and the church is hard to find anyway. And I'll, I'll just go back to sleep. But then a, a knock came on my door, and I went to open it, and there stood that student, and in his raincoat, dripping wet. On one arm, he had two umbrellas. He said, I thought you might have a hard time finding your church, especially in the rain. So I thought I would walk with you and show you where it is. And as I got dressed, I, I thought, what kind of fella is this? As we walked along in the rain under the two umbrellas, I said to myself, if this guy's so interested in my religion, I ought to know something about his. And so I asked him, where do you go to church? He said, oh, my, my church just around the corner. And I said, well, suppose we go to your church today and we'll go to my church next Sunday. I went with him to his church and I, I never went back to my own. After four years, I felt it was not the law for me, but rather I felt the calling of God upon my heart and uh, to go into the ordained ministry so I went to Drew Seminary and was ordained a Methodist minister, and I received an appointment to a Methodist church in the Philippines, and now I am a bishop in the Methodist church in the Philippines. Now the most important man in this story is not the Methodist bishop, but the man with two umbrellas. Now, now to the biblical story before us. What made young Samuel so open to the call of God that strange night in Eli's house. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. The young boy answered quickly and easily after he figured out who it was that was calling him. But he did not arrive at it, at that conclusion, as easily as, as we make it sound in sermons and, and Sunday school lessons. Samuel had been under the wing of Eli, the priest of Shiloh, and, and a judge of Israel ever since he'd been weaned. Eli was overseeing his service as a lifelong Nazarite. Now, Eli had no joy in, uh, with his own two sons, for they were reprobates and had no regard for God, even though they had been born into the priesthood of the Lord. So naturally, this made Samuel more than just an apprentice. Samuel was more like a, a surrogate son. And this pleased Hannah, Samuel's mother, for this was a child she prayed for and she promised to God. Well, during the night, Samuel heard a voice calling him. And he woke up and he went to the, the priest 
He said, here I am, you called me. And Eli said, no, you must be mistaken, go back to bed. This occurred a second time and then a third time. And finally, Eli, his, his spiritual senses kicked in and he, he was thinking this perhaps is not an event to, that can be ignored. And so he told young Samuel to go back to bed and listen for the divine revelation and say, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. The source of the interruption was none other than the God of, of Israel. Samuel would not have been able to respond to the call of God had it not been for his, for the influence of Eli, the priest. The influence of one life upon another is powerful. We all, we are all tremendously affected by what other people say and what other people do. There's an, there's an invisible pull of one life upon another. For example, in a concentration camp, Nazi concentration camp, where Martin Niemöller, a German theologian and the founder of the Confessing Church, was imprisoned, a Nazi agent was placed in a cell right next to him in hopes of converting the Christian minister to totalitarianism. He would be a great ally in their fight. After some days of observing God's prisoner, as he was called, observing his, his habits of devotion and his unfettered faith in the ultimate triumph of righteousness, the Nazi officer, the spy, called for a copy of the Bible, whereupon he was promptly removed from the jail, for the influencer was himself influenced. Once in the Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C., a tiny, tiny tube containing less than one two thousandths of an ounce of radium was accidentally dropped and broken on the hardwood floor. With the camel's hair brush, they swept all the, up the radium. And they washed the floor to get rid of the rest. But enough remained to render four more washings necessary. Each yielded even more radium. Finally, a carpenter scraped the floors three years later. The shavings were burned and the ashes were found to be strong with radium. We cannot get rid of influence. The Bible tells us that no one lives and, or dies to himself. To influence is to sway, to affect, to act upon be acted upon mental, moral, or spiritual power. The Bible illustrates influence as, as a leaven, influence as sound spreading forth, influence as salt, influence as ointment or fragrance, and negatively as a cancer. Influence is not an option for us. We all have it. The option is the kind of influence and, and how we will exert our influence. Everyone is contagious. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, knew this. And she wanted Eli, the priest, to influence her boy, Samuel. Eli was mature in the faith. He was someone with whom Samuel could be close. This kind of closeness makes one God's usher, leading souls God's way by a relationship of, of trust, friendship, mutual support, and, and loving honesty. I strongly believe the living Christ is present in this influence. Christ gets between the two people in the influence the witness, and the listener. Christ himself finally meets the other person using the, the witness as only an usher. This is a sacred witness because Jesus is present. He lives and this is the reason miracles happen. 
a miracle in which we, the talker and the listener, are both converts. I must look again as the witness at Christ because of the other one, the listener, also points to Christ. It is an experience that can only be called a miracle of betweenness, a factor in the Christian faith. This kind of influence, this miracle of betweenness, enabled Samuel to hear the call of God for his life. Whether or not Samuel would have found his way without Eli is a matter of speculation. The fact is, he did have the influence of Eli, which helped him so that he could hear the call of God upon his life. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The Bible is filled with accounts of God calling people in a special way and to a particular service. Those who are called of God stand in the best biblical tradition. God called Moses. God called Isaiah. God called Jeremiah. Saul of Tarsus was dramatically converted and became a chosen vessel in Acts 9. To the eleven, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. The scriptures make crystal clear that the fact of the divine call given by God to specific people for specific purposes is beyond debate. The mistake we make is to demand that God speak the same way to each of us. There is only one road to Damascus experience in the New Testament. That's Paul. There are many conversions, and many are called. Paul's experience on the road is not a model for all conversions and calls. Don't be waiting to get knock off, knocked off your donkey. That was the way he was converted. That's the way he called. And that's all that matters, but he was called he was converted. In the Bible, we see Amos, a poor herdsman of Tikwa. His campfire was burning, and he heard the call and saw the, the beckoning hand of God. The Lord took me from tending the flock and said, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Amos spoke with passion against the years of dark doings in high places, wealthy, wealth breeding, lo laziness, and rampant injustice. But Isaiah, Isaiah was a, was a friend of kings, and he was cultured and courtly. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated upon his throne. Mourning the fall of the king, he heard the voice of God saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah's answer was, Here I am, send me. Jeremiah, brooding about vocational direction, heard the voice of God saying to him, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. It was a call, clear call, greatly feared and reluctantly accepted. The biblical evidence has no set pattern, but a strong sense of the hand of the Lord was upon me is obvious. The manner of one's call may be different, but there's always a sense of, of divine initiative. So we are called, we are chosen, we are Christ for one another. I quote from a song long ago in my past, called in different ways and for different purposes. So see, thinking back, the question, question arises in my mind, do we bring with us one umbrella or two? One umbrella, Christ, 
Christian denies his call and his influence. But a true umbrella Christian answers God's voice and understands his call and the power of influence and focus, focuses it properly. Anyone can be a one umbrella Christian. A one umbrella Christian is, is a consumer of religion. He, he just picks and chooses and consumes it. But a two umbrella Christian is a disciple of Jesus Christ. A one umbrella Christian says, my needs first. A two umbrella Christian says, the kingdom of God comes first. And then makes his decisions based upon the kingdom, not just upon his own self. A one umbrella Christian says, what meets my convenience comes first. Two umbrella Christian says, what reaches people for Jesus Christ must come first. We're called to be two umbrella Christians, not how little can I do and get by to squeak in as it is said. But how much can I do when I realize what Jesus did? Do we just sample sermons and lessons becoming Gourmet, gourmet, religious gourmets, I guess as I'm trying to say. Or do we follow Jesus wherever he leads? I'll go whatever commitment it takes. This is only one way of describing discipleship in the light of our call and our influence. We are called to, to pick up that second umbrella to move from comfort to discipline, to move from consumerism to dedication. We should remember that Jesus said to us, take up your cross and follow me. Remember the man from the opening and what a difference that second umbrella made. Two umbrella Christians can change their world, thus fulfilling their call through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen.